integral over a volume of our three-dimensional space. And there's our integrand. Yeah. <laughs> so these two things we're linking together. Some of you, when you read the, the online lecture notes, or any book for that matter, will sometimes see uh, this expression alternately written as the divergence of the electric field equals rho over epsilon naught. The difference is this works as this works with the C G S system of units, and this works with the M K S system of units and it all determines it's all dependent upon what you do with the the value of the speed of light which comes out naturally from the experiments that we do in the cgs system of units what they do is to have unit emphasis on the electronic component of the field so that the magnetic field becomes defined in terms of it the situation is reversed when we work with MKS units. But anyway, you can, by eye, you can pick up the symmetry between that relates epsilon naught, which is the, the polarization, the electric polarization response of vacuum in relation to 4 pi. But the emphasis here is this 4 pi isn't a mathematical trick, concoction, a rabbit pulled out of the hat. It actually comes about directly from doing experiments. It's not, it's not a mathematical fiddle. It's something that really does come out from doing the experiments in the first place. The 4 pi has a physical basis for its presence in that uh, relation. So that's it with... Uh, we can go one step further because what we can do is replace the electric field in terms of its potential expression so that we can collapse the two differential equations, the divi and the curly, into just one equation, which is um, the way Maxwell originally did it, because he thought in terms of potentials, as I mentioned the other week. He never thought in terms of fields as such. So and potentials, because they're scalar, can be added very simply. And on occasions, it's much easier to solve electromagnetic problems in a scalar manner rather than a vector manner.
got our div curl pair. So the div e is 4 pi rho and the curl e is 0. So that's uh, true for the statics case. Now in terms of the potential, these two equations can be collapsed into one expression. So that uh, what we just finish up there with uh, electrostatics is actually where you begin to do your first lab. Now, the class, because there are so many of you in this year, you're divided into two lab groups. So Karen Fine Silver will have notified you on your landing page so that you will know whether you're doing lab one in week four next week. So on Friday, after the lecture hour, half of you will go off to do your first lab, which is a, a numerical computing lab where you'll use an Excel program to actually solve Laplace's equation. So just to make clear what the lab is, Equation. The fish equation. Pause on it. So you can uh, already go away. So the equation you're solving Poisson. That's Poisson equation. When grade squared equals a non zero function. That's been here, oh, yeah. So, I now have to do the Poisson's equation is the semester. The square 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 Laplace is that B, similar to the Laplace the transform. Yeah. yeah. So I have to revise the stuff that we did last semester. Laplace's equation yeah. is this what I've drawn here. But so not now. Yeah, obviously not now. But no, now I have to do it now. Well, oh, That's yeah, going yeah. to be your first laboratory because phi or V, whatever scalar field variable you want to use, this is the electrical potential. <coughs> and the idea is that in your laboratory you will have where you know, for example, that the um, a voltage is defined in one point of space, another voltage is defined somewhere else. But What's the, what, what voltage values exist in between in that spatial region? The first lab, therefore, is to uh, convert this differential equation into a difference equation where you run an iterative solution to numerically approximate the DE so that the numerical iteration is used to solve 
and approximate asymptotically what the analytical DE solution would be. Because not, it's not always possible to get a closed form solution to a differential equation, and you have to solve it numerically. So the objective of this first lab is just to expose to you the common method that is used in electromagnetics and antenna field theory of using computers to numerically solve difficult integrals, although this isn't a particularly difficult integral. So if you start to go away now and pre-read those notes so you don't waste unnecessary time uh, in your lab, it's just a matter of running the, the macro in the Excel spreadsheet and following the various instructions and noting out um, the various results. So for those of you in the second group of that lab one, you'll be doing it uh, in week five and respective um, deadlines for submitting the report electronically will be applied to you. Lab 2, Dr. De Brock uh, will make known to you later when it applies to you in week 8 and 9. So that has to do with a propagating wave on a waveguide system. Well, it can actually potentially be good times. Slightly sad because I'm bad too. Yeah, you just have to stay there. Stay there. Come on. Wait, wait, yeah. It's all perfect until we're. Uh, he's asleep. Huh? No, he's not. He's just. He's, uh, he's recovering from the mental. <laughs> oh, there you go. It's a miracle. This is a mental slap. You won't? This is a mental slap, yeah. yeah. It's like, pow! Well, let's check out the screen, it's freaking out. What happened? It stopped, I'm not sure, it stopped freaking out. It's like, over, everything's powered on. Everything's powered on. Yeah, it feels like it. Look, the lights are on. And it pulls up. Yeah. Good thing I figured out, to blow up in my pocket. My penis off it. <laughs> Oh, wait, don't skip me. Oh, oh, no, that's right. Don't skip oh, me. Sorry, dude. So again, just as I did in the electrostatics, all I'll do is uh, put up a few 
potted notes that summarise probably four or five PowerPoint slides in the online lecture note. So that effectively deals with a great slab of reading that you would do if you were to go to the online notes. And we similarly follow through a process of converting experimental results which are written in integral shorthand form into a div and a curl. So again, our ultimate objective is to describe the electric the magnetostatic field in terms of a div B, what will it be, and a curl B. What's it going to be? That's where we're going. And again, those results are going to come from experimental understanding. <laughs> no, I'm actually getting ready for them. That's, that's going to come off the edge of the cable. Yeah, being kind of like... I'm not keeping my eye on it. When it so you're probably familiar with conceptually what a, an electric dipole is. It simply is where you're able to spatially separate a plus charge from a minus charge. So for example, if, uh, in, if in any system you can achieve the separation, because naturally as you know, plus and minus want to be together. If you can spatially isolate them, you've created a dipole. And the dipole will always try to orient itself with an electric field to try and minimise the stress being put on to, onto it by the electric field. So a, a dipole is just simply given as the product of the charge and the distance by which they're separated. In terms of magnetostatics, you're probably less familiar with what's meant by a magnetic dipole moment. As soon as you take a charge, whether it's plus or minus, it doesn't matter what its sign is, and you make that charge move in a closed loop, it generates a current. So if this little electron, for example, was made to move in a circle, once it goes through circular motion, it immediately generates a magnetic field. The electric charge undergoing circular motion traces out a loop that in turn defines a certain area. So we have an element of area that that looping charge creates as it spins. So you have current because it's going through closed loop or circular motion. So if you have the, the product of the charge with the surface area, that is the magnetic dipole moment in analogy to the electric dipole moment. And if you look also in terms of what the curl operation is telling you, you know that uh, the magnitude of, uh, it's the magnitude of two vectors, A cross B, that's effectively calculating the area of a trapezium. And So sine theta takes on its maximum value at pi on 2, which means if you've got two vectors orthogonal to each other, the cross product is maximized. So for example, if we're saying that this is the area of a trapezium and there's our theta, of course when this edge here is at right angles to that edge there, you do get the maximum area of the rectangle. And if you close this angle down, you go to zero area. All systems want to occupy their lowest state of internal energy. You come home, the first thing you want to do is probably flop on the lounge chair and hit the TV, rather than run up and down flights and flights of steps. All systems in the universe will want to occupy their lowest state of energy. The thing that will turn this to zero is if both this vector and this vector are co-aligned. So for example, if you've got a needle and you stroke the needle with a bar magnet, all the little domains will click into place. In fact, I did a, when I was an undergraduate in my third year, we had a, an experiment where you had a, 
a microphone attached to the needle, and you could hear the magnetic domains clicking into place, clicking it all the way through on the rod. So each of the ferrite crystal domain elements start to lock into place if they're soft uh, ferrite systems. So that as you stroke with a permanent bar magnet down the axis of a needle, for example, it becomes magnetized. And if you tie a thin piece of cotton to the needle and place it near a bar magnet, you'll see the needle swing. So the needle, which is effectively going to be, if you make the needle small enough, it effectively approximates what's going on here. The needle will literally align itself with the magnetic field to turn this whole expression to zero. So that if you have theta equals zero degrees, it forces A cross B to zero. So you've got a zero energy system. And that's the natural state of things. If you leave it to itself, you will have natural alignment of these two vectors with each other. And that's essentially the basis by which we begin to understand the magnetostatic field and describe it. So just to put that into a few quick points for you so you can refer back to it. So whenever you see one of these vector equations, think to yourself, what is it telling me physically? These dots and these crosses really do mean something in actual practice. And if you understand the idea of uh, torque itself, if you're placed under stress, a torque stress, a twisting stress, you will want to undo it. I don't know if anyone's done a, given you a Chinese arm burn on your forearm where they grab you like that. You will do anything to minimize that stress or any sort of twisting motion on you. And that's essentially what's going on with this kind of system as well. It operates both at the atomic scale all the way through to, to galactic scales. The same physics is working here. So, just as a um, side note, so it's just a, a little digression explaining what we mean there with that uh, equation there. So, if you've got a needle, hmm.
I emphasize this first point because it has a very powerful link with electrostatics. It's very fortunate for us that both electrostatics and magnetostatics are linear theories, which means that you can resolve the field into an X and a Y component, add all the X components separately, add all the Y components separately, and then bring the two components back together to get a final field result. So you can just have a scalar sum of components linearly to get your final answer. It happens with magnetostatics and electrostatics, and you'll have a few tutorial examples that you can play with, and the solutions are already provided for you. And uh, so I strongly encourage you to do that, because you will find that in past years, it's often been a favorite question for examiners uh, in this course, is to apply, to demonstrate that you understand the linear nature of the summation of these two static fields, either electric or magnetic or statics. So have a look at some of those examples and understand some of the, the partially worked and fully worked solutions that are given there. Anyway, so I emphasize that this is all experimentally based and that's a linear theory. flowing through the wire, and you noted that if a magnet was brought near to it, it was influenced by the current flowing in that wire, hmm. and that was the first direct connection between electricity and magnetism. And it's from Ampere's law that we start to get our first understanding of how to work out Gib V and Curl V. Summarize about 10 PowerPoint slides. <laughs> 